Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, it's my great pleasure to speak in this seminar. I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation. Okay. Uh, today, I will talk about a uh, group based the zeta functions arising from real and piadic groups. Uh, they share some uh, properties with the familiar uh, zeta functions. Okay. So here I exhibit two familiar zeta functions. The first is the Riemann zeta function, uh, which can be expressed as a product over primes p, of uh, one over one minus p to the minus, minus s. And uh, uh, the Riemann hypothesis is a big uh, open question uh, for the Riemann zeta function. Okay. And the second uh, zeta function is the zeta function attached to a smoothly reducible projective variety defined over a finite field. Okay. And uh, its zeta function counts the number of rational points uh, over finite extensions of the base field. So when we collect these numbers uh, together and organize it in the right way, and that zeta function can be expressed also as an infinite product, the over close points, okay in the form of one over one minus u to the degree of the points. So, uh, so in, in this context, the close points plays uh, the role of the primes. Okay. And it's well known that uh, this infinite product converges to a rational function. So I will see that as the alternating product of polynomials with coefficients in z and the constant term one. Actually, so each polynomial PI is the reverse characteristic polynomial or the Frobenius acting on the ice uh, analytic cohomology of the variety. Okay. And uh, as you can see, that uh, the bottom polynomials uh, have uh, are indexed by the even integers and the top one by the odd integers. Okay. And for zeta function attached to a variety, uh, the, its Riemann hypothesis is known to hold, which means that uh, if a polynomial PI is not constant, then uh, all its roots have the same absolute value. In this case, it's a Q to the minus I over two. Okay. So now we move to the zeta functions arising from groups. So the first one is the zeta function, uh, the Selberg zeta function. Okay. So we know that uh, the SL2R acts on the upper half plane by fractional linear transformations. Okay. So we take a discrete torsion-free co-compact subgroup of SL2R, and we look at its orbit space. Okay. So upper half plane mod out by gamma. Okay. Because of the choice of the group, uh, this orbit space is a compact Riemann surface. And uh, with its fundamental group, isomorphic to the group gamma. Okay. Now, this upper plane uh, has, uh, can be interpreted as a homogeneous space, which is a PGO2R mod out by uh, its maximum compact subgroup. Okay. So, on this uh, compact Riemann surface, what uh, we are interested in is to count the closed geodesics. Uh, okay. And so, but I would like to say a few words about what kind of closed geodesics uh, we are interested in. Okay. So normally, if we just pick up a closed geodesic, it has a starting point and has an orientation. But we, what we are interested in is that the closed geodesics such that when you change the starting point and you travel along it, it is still remains a closed geodesic. And this kind of closed geodesic, we call that a geodesic cycle. So, that, so we are interested in counting the geodesic cycles. Okay. So let me uh, explain, well, well, what kind of, uh, what is a geodesic cycle? Okay, so <clears throat> we have a closed geodesic on the uh, quotient. We can lift it uh, up uh, in the upper plane. We get a ge geodesic path from a point on the upper plane to another z to another point, gamma z, 
for some element gamma in the group, which is not identity. Okay. So that, now that's uh, this element of gamma, okay, uh, because of the, uh, the choice of our group, this gamma is a hyperbolic element. As such, it has two fixed points on the real uh, union infinity. Okay. So through these two fixed points, there's a unique uh, geodesic, which is the uh, semicircle. Okay. And uh, this semicircle is invariant under the action of gamma. Okay. So if we pick a point Z on this semicircle, then we know that a gamma Z, well, lies here and likewise a gamma square Z and so on. So then this portion of uh, the geodesic from Z to gamma Z, when you uh, uh, pass it to the quotient, we identify these two endpoints, we get a closed geodesic. But this closed geodesic has the feature that if I change the starting point, say Z prime, I travel along it, actually I will end up with a gamma Z prime, as you can see that, uh, so it is uh, still a closed geodesic. So, so then the uh, geodesic arising from uh, this z to gamma z uh, for this z uh, chosen on the semicircle gives us a desired geodesic cycle. And all the geodesic cycles arise this way. And incidentally, if I choose this z, which is outside of this upper plane, and then if I do the same thing, connecting Z with the gamma Z, then uh, it will, when I pass it to the quotient, it will not have this property. Okay. So all the geodesic cycles, or all the geodesic things we are going to consider in the future have this feature that when I change the starting point, it remains a geodesic. Okay. So we want to count the geodesic cycles. But then because we are in this uh, continuous situation, there are many different initial points. So we're going to ignore the in starting point. We say that we can uh, count them up to equivalence. Okay. <laughs> so, well, well, a geodesic cycle is called a primitive. It is not obtained by repeating a cycle of shorter length more than once, okay. Then uh, the equivalence classes of uh, primitive geodesic cycles are called a prime, are called primes of this compact Riemann surface. Okay. So what we are interested in counting are actually either prime or prime powers. So just these two kind of uh, uh, geodesics are. Okay. So to them. Selberg defined the uh, zeta function, okay, which is uh, as follows. So he did this in 1956. So you take product over all the primes and it factors one minus e to the uh, minus length of the uh, geodesic, then times s. And to also include all the other uh, prime powers, so to speak, we shift S by the positive integers K. So we have the second product, K, we think is zero, okay. So from the way I describe this um, geodesic, we see that uh, the, the geodesics that we are considering, well, corresponds to conjugacy classes of the group, gamma, uh, non-trivial conjugacy classes, okay. And uh, the primes will correspond to a conjugacy class, uh, conjugacy classes generated by the so-called primitive elements. Okay. So an element is primitive if it generates its centralizer in the gamma. Okay. So there are two ways to see that this Selberg zeta function. Okay. And because our <laughs> Uh, quotient x, mark, uh, uh, x gamma is a compact Riemann surface. So there's a Laplacian operator acting on that, on the, uh, the space of L2 functions on the Riemann surface. And uh, it, it has discrete spectrum starting from zero 
and uh, then goes up and go all the way to going to infinity. Okay. So Selberg ha, has shown that uh, the several zeta function uh, behaves very much like the Riemann zeta function. Okay. In particular, it has a simple pole at s equal to one. Okay. And uh, it differs from the Riemann zeta function in that uh, it's zeros in the uh, critical strip of uh, the real part of S between zero and one are known. Okay. Uh, they are expressed in terms of the uh, eigenvalues of the Laplacian. Okay. In other words, all the non-trivial zeros of the several zeta function are the uh, solutions to uh, eigenvalue lambda n equal to S times one minus S for n at least one. So as we see from this expression of the zeros, that when this lambda n is less than one quarter, there are finitely many of them. So we obtain the real zeros of the Selberg zeta function in the critical strip. And there are only finitely many of them. And uh, the remaining ones uh, will get a complex roots and they all have the property that uh, it's a, they sit on the vertical line, real s equal to one half. So the Riemann hypothesis holds, except for finitely many real zeros. Okay. So in view of this uh, uh, zeros in the critical strip, so we expect that uh, this uh, Selberg zeta function well, has close relations with this product of this eigenvalue lambda m minus s times one minus s. Okay. But unfortunately, uh, this infinite product does not converge. But on the other hand, because this lambda n's are the eigenvalue of uh, delta, so this infinite product really, I mean, uh, if this were finite product, then this is exactly would be the uh, determinant of the Laplacian minus, uh, minus s times one minus s. So indeed, uh, there's a way to, uh, make this uh, idea rigorous. So to define the determinant of the Laplacian, okay, uh, using the spectral zeta function so that uh, formally it is equal to this infinite product, okay, lambda times s minus times one minus s, okay. So in, uh, in 1987, Sarnak and independently Boros uh, came up with the expression, uh, which gives a relationship between the several zeta function and the determinant of Laplacian. Okay, so this determinant of Laplacian is equal to several zeta function times this uh, extra factor. Okay, so as you can see that uh, this extra factor here uh, is e to the constant plus s times y minus s. And I use is the bonds double gamma function squared over gamma s times two pi to the s. So this factor here is independent of gamma. It's raised to twice of the genus of the Riemann surface minus two. So its exponent here gives the uh, topological information of this Riemann surface. Uh, so this uh, theorem is extended uh, to allow gamma uh, cofinite, okay, by Efrat and uh, Koyama in 1991. Okay. okay. So now, so Ihara looked at the Selberg's uh, uh, zeta function, and so he thinks about that. Uh, it's um, you see that this uh, Riemann uh, surface expressed as a double coset of the PGO2R. Okay. So he thinks that, uh, well, what happens if we replace R by a periodic field, by QP? So that's uh, the completion of a Q at uh, the um, Archimedean, a non Archimedean place. Okay. And then uh, he, he studies to see what happens. So that's the. Uh, what we are going to do. Okay. 
So we can see that the P, uh, replacing R by QP. So we take a PGO to QP, mod R by its maximum compact on the right. And on the left, take a discrete torsion-free co-compact subgroup. Okay. So we have this double coset. We call that X gamma. Okay. So to this double coset, you have a defined zeta function, just as similar to uh, the Selbo zeta function. It's a product of uh, the conjugacy classes of uh, gamma uh, for the uh, primitive gammas. And each factor is one over one minus u to the length of gamma. Okay. So this uh, converges, say, for the uh, u uh, absolute value u small. Okay. So now the question is that, well, so we think of this a PGO2 QP, a mod, it's maximum compact, that's the piatic upper half plane. So what is this, this piatic upper half plane? Okay, so this piatic upper half plane actually uh, can be interpreted as a p plus one regular tree. So it is a tree that each vertex has exactly p plus one neighbors. Okay, so and the vertices of this uh, uh, tree are the uh, cosets of a PGO two ZP. Okay, we can interpret each coset as the uh, equivalence class of a rank two lattice over ZP. Then uh, two lattices are adjacent. If they can be represented by lattices, so L and L prime, such that the L prime is strictly between L and the PL, okay? Then PL is strictly between L prime and the PL prime, and they, um, so PL and the L represent the same vertex. So this is undirected graph. So, so in this case, that, that is L prime has index P inside L. Okay. So when we interpret this piatic upper plane as a P plus one regular tree, then when we mod out the gamma, uh, so we get this X gamma, uh, then becomes a uh, finite P plus one regular graph. Okay. So say so notice this, and uh, you remark that uh, so this the Harris data function defined using the groups can be reinterpreted as the, uh, the zeta function defined on the uh, closed geodesics. Okay, for the uh, this uh, p plus one regular graph. Okay, it's by exactly the same same uh, identity, and uh, and therefore it counts the uh, closed geodesics uh, inside uh, this uh, graph. Now, because we are in a graph, which is a dis uh, discrete case, so when we count the closed geodesics, uh, the different starting point is viewed as a different uh, closed geodesic cycles. Okay. And uh, the prime, again, has the same uh, definition as before. It's a uh, equivalence class of primitive closed geodesic cycles. Okay, so uh, the uh, graph zeta function in this definition uh, it's the similar to the zeta function associated to uh, curves defined over finite field, for instance. Okay, so what's the I mean the property of this uh, zeta function? So in 1966, Yahara showed that uh, this zeta function also converges to a rational function. Okay, so its numerator is one minus u squared raised to the Euler characteristic of the graph, which is the number of vertices minus number of edges. So that it gives the uh, <coughs> uh, topological information about the graph. And the denominator is a determinant of identity matrix minus the adjacency matrix times u, plus PU squared times identity matrix. So this uh, adjacency matrix a graph, well, it's a square matrix, has rows and the columns parameterized by the vertices of the graph, and the IJ entry records the number of edges from vertex I to vertex J. So as such, it is a real symmetric matrix, so all its eigenvalues are real. We can arrange it from large to small. 
And since the graph is uh, uh, p plus one regular, it's easy to show that eigenvalue sits between p plus one and the minus of p plus one. And, uh, and uh, it does achieve the p plus one as eigenvalue uh, with the all one function as eigenvector. Okay, so in other words, this denominator of the zeta function can be expressed as the product of one minus the eigenvalue of the uh, adjacency matrix uh, A times U plus PU squared. So these eigenvalues of A are called the uh, spectrum of the uh, graph. So denominator gives the spectrum information of the graph. So this expression is very similar to what we saw for the silver zeta function, except that this expression was proved uh, what, more than 20 years earlier. Okay. okay. So uh, for, we know that the zeta function for nice curve satisfy the Riemann hypothesis, as I said at the beginning. Then how about the zeta function for the graphs? Okay. Uh, I should also remark that uh, this Euler characteristic for uh, this uh, regular graph actually is a negative integer. So this one minus u, so the numerator actually goes to denominator is a power of one minus u squared. Okay. So <clears throat> this zeta function actually is one over a polynomial. So the poles, this plus minus one coming from the numerator, so to speak, and the poles coming from the eigenvalues p plus one and the minus p plus one, they are called the uh, trivial poles of the zeta. And that uh, the remaining poles coming from the non-trivial eigenvalues, which are strictly between p plus one and the minus p plus one, they, are, they, they give rise to the non-trivial poles. Okay. So we say that uh, this uh, several zeta, uh, sorry, this the Hara zeta function satisfies the Riemann hypothesis if all the uh, poles from the non-trivial eigenvalues have the same absolute value, in this case is a p to the minus one half. So this happens um, if and only if all the non-trivial eigenvalues have uh, absolute value bounded by uh, twice square root of p. And the graphs with these properties are called the Ramnogen graphs. So in other words, the uh, zeta function satisfies the Riemann hypothesis if and only if the graph is Ramnogen graph. Okay. So in other words, uh, for p plus one regular graphs, not everybody are satisfied the Riemann hypothesis, only special kind of uh, graph satisfy the Riemann hypothesis. They are called the Ramnogen graphs. Okay. So now uh, let me give you some uh, <laughs> connection between the zeta functions of uh, graphs and the zeta functions of curves. So as we uh, explained over here, okay. Uh, so maybe some Ramjung, um, if we look at the Ramjung graphs, they satisfy the Riemann hypothesis. And uh, maybe uh, they, some Ramjung graphs could be related to the zeta function of the curves. Okay. So here's one example. Okay. So we have this uh, tree, p plus one regular tree, we just have to choose a nice uh, group such that after uh, we mod out, we come up with this uh, Ramjung graphs and which uh, its data is related to uh, a curve, okay? And so one, one choice of such kind of uh, group gamma is as follows. So we take a definite quaternion algebra uh, over Q, which ramifies on an infinity and a, a prime L, which is not equal to P. And we let DL be its multiplicative group modulo center. Okay. So because of our choice of quaternion algebra, so if I look at the QP points of DL, it is exactly PGL to QP. Okay. And so for the discrete uh, co-compact subgroup, we just choose the, uh, the subgroup of uh, cube uh, of DL, which, uh, which is uh, integral points everywhere, except uh, we, we allow P in the denominator. 
Okay, so that is our gamma L. Okay. And this group is torsion free if L is come to one modulo 12. Okay. So in this case, well, we get the Ramjin graph. And also, if I go back and look at uh, its zeta function, we look at a denominator here. Okay. So it, uh, the, we have the trivial eigenvalue, p plus one. Okay. Let's remove the, the factor from the denominator. And the remaining part will be coming from the non-trivial eigenvalues. And the non-trivial eigenvalues are all satisfied by the, the, the Ramanujan bound. Okay. And turns out that uh, uh, using the, uh, the theorem by Hirashimura, if I remove the uh, factor from the trivial eigenvalue, then the remaining part of the denominator of the zeta function of this graph is actually equal to the P1 the, of the zeta function of the module curve of X naught L mod P. So uh, in short, uh, when for some choice of gamma and uh, this uh, interesting part of the uh, zeta function of the uh, graph, it's actually is also the interesting part of the zeta function of a curve defined over a finite field. Okay. So next, well, uh, Hashimoto expressed another way to think about the uh, closed uh, geodesic. Okay. So uh, for graphs, when we describe it, so closed geodesics, usually we think of that as a sequence of vertices. And to describe adjacency, we have the adjacency operator A. But when we compute a trace of uh, the uh, powers of uh, adjacency operator, I mean A, then uh, it also gives us a closed uh, uh, paths uh, which are not geodesic. Okay. So to guarantee that we only count the geodesic cycles that we want, the Hashimoto suggests that we should express uh, them as uh, the, uh, a sequence of the directed paths. So in this way, to each edge of a finite graph, we associate two opposite orientations. Okay. So then uh, the neighbors of a directed edge from U to V are the directed edges from V to W with a W not equal to U. Okay. So when we define that, that neighbors this way, and so then we can come up with the uh, directed edge adjacency, adjacency matrix. Then uh, when we raise to the nth power, compute the trace, and that will give us precisely the uh, closed uh, geodesic uh, cycles of uh, the geodesic cycles of length n that we want. Okay. So because of this relation, we have another expression of a zeta function, which is one over uh, the uh, re reverse Cavrizi polynomial of this uh, edge adjacency matrix T. Okay. So therefore for the graph, uh, there are two ways to uh, express the zeta function. One uses the vertex adjacency, the other one uses the directed edge adjacency. Okay. So, uh, so when, when, so this actually works for any uh, regular graphs. So when, when we look at our case uh, for the uh, PGO2 over, over QP, then this A actually uh, can be also expressed uh, group theoretically as heck operator. And the T is the uh, Iwahoric heck operator. Okay. So, uh, we, one can also consider the Artin L functions attached to graphs, for instance. Uh, so one can take the uh, finite dimensional unitary representations of the fundamental group, so which is the gamma, and we can define the Artin L functions. And uh, for Artin L functions, also has uh, two uh, expressions, has the expressions in two ways, just like what we saw for the zeta function. So this was done by Hara, Hashimoto, and Stark Terrace. Okay. And for the um, Riemann surface uh, that uh, surfaces that are silver considered, okay, 
Uh, one can also do the same thing, take a finite dimensional unitary representation and uh, define the RTL function. Okay. So this RTL function uh, in 2015, the uh, poll showed that uh, actually uh, one can express this, uh, this RTL function as a determinant of one minus an operator, which she called a transfer operator, which depends on S and the representation. So this expression is just like a Hashimoto's expression. So what I want could ask is that, uh, well, what is the uh, spectral expression, like uh, the work of Sanak Voros, okay, uh, using the, uh, the, eigen, the spectrum, okay. And uh, so uh, what is the, the other side for this row, uh, which is non-trivial? Um, I didn't find it in the literature. Okay. Okay. So next, we go to the next stage uh, from PGL2 to PGL3. Okay, again, more QP. Okay. So, uh, uh, so in, instead of when we look at a PGO2 part uh, case, then we get a people's one regular tree. And for the PGO3, then what we get is called a Bruhatis building. So it is a contractible two-dimensional simplicial complex. Okay. And the vertices are parameterized by the uh, PGO3 QP model by its maximum compact. And uh, again, the uh, Two vertices adjacent, I mean, but it's defined by the same way as before. And the three mutually adjacent vertices uh, form a chamber, or oh, no, well, it's a triangle. Okay. And the group uh, PGO3QP will act on this um, building, <clears throat> transitively on, on vertices, and uh, preserves the uh, adjacency. Okay. So if we think of our trees, as uh, gluing together these infinite lines along some edges. Then this two-dimensional building is obtained by gluing together Euclidean planes along some triangles, okay? So each Euclidean plane is tiled by uh, equilateral triangles, okay? So if I choose any point on this plane, okay, so it has, I mean, in this case, there has six vertices. So three vertices, well, are represented by lattice, which index P uh, versus the original vertex. And the other three has, uh, has uh, index P squared. So all the neighbors represented by lattices with index P, well, are represented by heck operator uh, A1. And the other one is by HEC operators, uh, HEC operator A2. So the edge to the uh, uh, vertices uh, with index P are called a type one edges and the other one called a type two edges. Okay. So when we reverse the directions, then they will swap the types. Okay. So the edges uh, on this building are parameterized by a parahoric, uh, Co-sets of parahoric subgroup. Okay. <laughs> so since uh, so we have uh, this Euclidean plane, so our metric will be just the usual Euclidean metric. So when we consider the geo geometric, uh, sorry, geodesic path, so I take an edge, say type one edge, I consider what are the allowable uh, path um, that um, enables. So one is uh, an uh, going to say to the right, so that's a type one. And uh, it has two other type one edges, but then there's a turn. So that we, are, we do not allow the turns, we have to go straight forward. So this is, so this is what happens in this uh, plane. It, I mean, you can use a different plane. So as long as they put together, it gives us a straight line. Okay. So this kind of uh, neighboring relations can be expressed by a parahoric operator, okay? We call the LE. And the, since type two edges are the opposite of type one, so and then this adjacency is a transpose of LE, okay? Now for the triangle, okay? So for to each triangle, 
we associate the three directed triangles. Okay, so we uh, pick the orientation, which is uh, such that the sides are the type type one sides. So if I have this uh, three vertices A B C, so we have A B C, then we have B C A and the C A B. So these are the three directed uh, chambers, and the directed chambers are parameterized by the cosets of Iwahorek subgroup. And so if I take a directed chamber ABC and its neighbor will be those I'm mean, sharing the BCH edge. So it will be BCD with the D not equal to A. Okay. So then this kind of adjacency is described by a um, Iwahori hacker operator LB. So all the combinatorial adjacency has a corresponding group theoretic operators to that. So we do the same thing as before. We choose the nice uh, discrete torsion for equal complex of group and mark out on the left side, we get a finite two-dimensional simplicial complex. Okay, so then on this complex, we well consider the uh, geodesics. So so it's a two-dimensional, so we have the, um, the well, we also have two, uh, two kinds of uh, geodesics. So one is uh, using the directed edges. So we have either geodesic cycles using all the type one edge or using all the type two edges. So counting those numbers, it's exactly the same expression, okay. And, uh, that zeta function can be expressed as one over determinant one minus uh, this uh, parahoric operator times u if it's a type one edge. If it's a type two, for, for some reasons we're going to, uh, then it, we put uh, u, uh, u squared, okay? Because its neighbors, uh, well, has index of uh, p squared, okay? And, uh, Putting the zeta function of using the type one edges and type two edges together, we get as well, we call it, we get the uh, edge zeta function for this uh, finite quotient x gamma. So it's equal to one over that uh, the uh, LEU and the other one is just, well, did that one minus its transpose times u squared. Okay. So then, because it's two-dimensional, we also consider the chamber zeta function, okay? So we take a chamber, which is a triangle, and then we move it around uh, following the allowable uh, neighbors, okay? So on this uh, plane, so it will uh, move out to give us a strip like this one to the tail to the right or tail to the left, and the third one will be horizontal. So there are three possible strips. Okay. So, and when we pass through the quotient and we again count the, the geodesic, we call the galleries because it's two dimensional of a given length. Okay. So, uh, uh, as here, as we can see that when we take this trip, uh, we have two orientations. We can go, go up or go down. So we take the orientation such that the boundaries are all the type two. Uh, so, I mean, if we take the opposite one, it will be the same zeta. Okay. So I just want to uh, make a, a remark that, uh, so I, if I take this trip, so I start with the chamber, directed chamber X, then somewhere I have a gamma X. So in the, when I pass the quotient, I will glue them together to get the uh, geodesic galleries. So I look at the boundary, okay. It's a boundary is a type two uh, geodesic cycle, okay. But the way we glue it together, I mean, have two possibilities. One is that we end up with a cylinder, so it has two boundaries. And the other possibility is that we end up with a Mobius strip. So in that case, we only have one boundary. Okay. So this is the, the interesting part. Okay. Okay. So now uh, we have the description of the zeta functions uh, for the, uh, the edges and the zeta functions for the uh, chambers. Okay. And uh, put together, they also satisfy some identities similar to what we saw for the graphs. Okay. So in terms of, we can express that in terms of the operators. 
about the edge adjacency and the chamber adjacency, okay? Or just the other data, okay? And it's equal to another, the other side uses the operator of the vertices, okay? So for the uh, graphs, we have denominator is a degree two polynomial in U, but for the, uh, the PGO3, it denominators degree three polynomial in U and uses the both heck operators, okay? And the numerator is one minus U cubed to the Euler characteristic of the, uh, this uh, two-dimensional simplicial complex. So uh, the red is that uh, as we see that uh, in terms of the, the zeta function. So this one over the uh, determinant using the heck operators, uh, that's why I call that uh, zeta function associated zeta zero because it uses the operator on vertices. And the zeta zero actually is the Langlands L function, okay. So if I divide this zeta zero to the uh, left-hand side, so we do have the even, uh, zeta index zeta as a denominator and uh, the, uh, the top will be the zeta as indexed by the odd dimensions. Okay. And uh, in, so one special thing I will notice is that, uh, well, for the chambers, one needs to uh, change the sign, okay. And uh, this identity will extend it to PGOM by Kang and uh, JKU, okay. And, uh, but, so there are some, some subtleties, but the, the idea is what we see here. Okay. So uh, can I ask a question? It's yeah. Peter. I, um, when you say part two at the bottom of 20 of the page that that is a Langlands L function, you mean if you choose gamma, of course, most things are arithmetic once you're in higher rank, but is that what you mean here? Or what, what's your definition of a Langlands L function in this context? So you, so you look at the... Uh, so you, you look at the representations which appears in uh, L2 of the, the group mother gamma on the left and of which the, the spherical representations appear in this L function. So for each uh, irreducible spherical, spherical representation, you have the associated Langlands. So this thing is a product of all the representations which appear there. Okay, all right, thanks. Okay, so, uh, so there are three proofs to this identity. The first one is uh, combinatorial, okay. So uh, to prove it, we take the logarithmic derivative of both sides and try to show that they are equal. So this one is really counting. Uh, this is how this uh, identity was discovered because we, we counted the, the, the geodesic cycles and the, and the geodesic galleries, I mean and compare with the expression on the right-hand side. So this is uh, uh, hard work, okay. So I will not say too much about it, but uh, it's from this counting, uh, we, we noticed that uh, you see that when I define that uh, this, all this zeta function, et cetera, especially for the, um, for the cycles, we, I only define it in terms of the, the primes. Okay. I did not define it in terms of conjugacy classes of gamma because there's no good uh, uh, expression to say that uh, which conjugacy classes of uh, gamma uh, which we should pick. It certainly includes uh, those conjugacy classes generated by primitive elements, but there are other things involved. And the second one, uh, because of this, uh, we, our combinatorial objects have group background, so we use the group theory, so it's a use representation theory. Okay. So we regard these operators, uh, heck operators, and the uh, your horic, uh, uh, parahoric operators and uh, your horic heck operators. Uh, as the, uh, I, I regard them as the operators on the L2 functions on the uh, PGO3 QP model by gamma, uh, which are right invariant under the maximum compact for A1, A2 and the uh, parahoric subgroup for the LE and the euahoric subgroups. Okay. So we uh, really wanted to compute the, the eigenvalues to really find out the zeros of uh, 
the top and the bottom and to see how they cancel and compare both sides. Okay. So when we see them, uh, the functions is on the L2 space. So that means that uh, we should uh, think about the whole thing, the L2 space of the uh, pgl 3 qp model by gamma. And the group pgl 2 qp on the act on the right-hand side and decompose this space into the uh, uh, pieces of the uh, unitary irreducible representations. Okay. So what of interest to us are those representations which contain the Iwahoric fixed uh, vectors. So, and uh, so when we collect those and put it together and we can well, get what we want, okay. So for such kind of representations are uh, the work of uh, Kesselman and Tadik uh, have classified them into five types, okay. So for each type, we just compute what I say, what are the eigenvalues of the Iwahori hack operators on the space of uh, Iwahori fixed vectors, just compute them for each type. Okay. And the likewise for those, uh, of, uh, for the other operators. Okay. So once we, so this uh, really allows us to find out the zeros of uh, each uh, term. And uh, then, uh, then for each given representation, we can see just before our eyes how, how the zeros cancel with each other and uh, to, to, to see that this identity holds. And the other uh, proof is a uh, cohomological because this uh, uh, one minus u cubed to the Euler characteristic. I mean, this uh, uh, Euler characteristic is really very suggestive that, that uh, they should have some cohomological uh, way to prove it. Okay. And so. <laughs> So for this, we construct a co-chain complex, okay? And uh, each co-chain group is the, uh, the polynomial ring with coefficient C valued functions on the directed uh, simplices, like on the C0 will be on the vertices, the C1 will be on the directed edges, type one and type two, and the C2 will be on the directed chambers, okay? So we have, and uh, then we can, well, then we have the co-boundary maps, which are the uh, some variations of the standard co-boundary maps. Okay. And the key is to construct endomorphisms uh, on this uh, co-chain. So we construct, uh, find some automorphism phi, phi zero on the C naught, phi one on C one, and the phi two on C two. Okay. And such that uh, uh, that map. Like when I compare to another map, which is just multiplication by one minus u cubed on each cochain group. And these two uh, endomorphisms of the uh, cochain, they are homotopic. Okay. When they are homotopic, that means that uh, the, when I look at determinant of the, the first one, using the phi, phi i's on the cohomology hi, is equal to the determinant of the second map, one minus u cubed on hi, okay. So then when I do the alternating product of say phi i on the cohomology group, that's equal to the uh, alternating product of the determinant of uh, phi i on the cohomology group. And similarly for the use one minus u cubed, but for one minus u cubed part, we can compute it we get one minus u cubed times the dimension, which is the number of vertices minus twice the number of edges plus three times the number of chambers. Okay. So then we just need to compute the determinant of the phi on, on the left-hand side. So we compute the determinant of phi on C naught is Z naught to the inverse and the C1 is Z1 inverse then times one minus u cubed to the number of edges. On the C2 is one uh, Z2, uh, inverse times one minus u cubed or twice of numbers. So when you put it together, you see that it just cancel up quite right. Okay. And this cohomological method is very convenient. We can generalize it to get a similar identity for the R in L function associated to finite dimensional and unitary representation for the group gamma. 
It's also the cohomological method that which uh, allows the Kang and E to prove the, the zeta identity for the PGON case. Okay. <laughs> so now how about the Riemann hypothesis? Okay. So we first we define that, that this uh, finite portion is a Ramanujan complex. Uh, if all the uh, non-trivial zeros coming from this uh, determinant using the heck operators have the same absolute value, which is a p to the minus one. Okay. And from the representation theoretic language, this means that uh, all the uh, non-trivial spherical representations of a appear in the L2 or PG3 QP mod out by gamma, well, are tempered. And uh, because uh, we have this express uh, explicit information about the, the, the zeros, okay. So from, from the uh, Ramanujan on, on the uh, op uh, heck operator side, we can see that that's equivalent to all the representations appear in the, with the <clears throat> parahoric uh, invariant, uh, containing parahoric invariant uh, vectors that uh, they should uh, be uh, tempered. And uh, likewise, uh, the euahoric ones should also be tempered. So, so, so they are all, I, I mean, one implies I mean, any other. So in this sense, we say that uh, this finite quotient is Ramanujan complex. If and only if it's zeta, each uh, zeta i, okay, is satisfied the Riemann hypothesis for the i equals zero, one, two, okay. So this Riemann hypothesis doesn't mean that, that they all have the same eigenvalues, but it means that, that the representations are tempered, but they, they have, they will have different bunches of eigenvalues as you can see uh, from in each case, what are the possible eigenvalues. Okay. Okay. So next, uh, another uh, degree two, uh, another dimension two building is associated to the symplectic groups. Okay. So in this case, uh, the each plane is a parameter as a tiled by triangles of a different shapes. But the main difference is that uh, there are two kinds of vertices. The black ones, they are called the uh, primitive vertices. They are parameterized by the uh, PGSP4 mod Macron's compact. But they are the red vertices, um, they, I mean, they, they don't show up, okay. So be between the, uh, the black vertices, there are two kinds of edges. We say that of a type uh, spin and the standard, and uh, there are two types of the uh, edges. <laughs> so the, 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 dot, uh, the, the slanted ones are the uh, spin type and the dotted ones are the uh, standard type. There are also two kinds of chambers. And we can do the same game as before. We also came with a similar identity. Okay, so this identity is that, um, so for the one dimensional cycles of spin type and the standard type divided by two dimensional cycles of spin type is equal to one minus u squared to the Euler characteristic uh, times another factor, then times the zeta function of a vertices of spin type. So the zeta function of vertices of spin type is the Langlands L uh, called the Langlands L function of the spin type. It's a degree four in U, okay, using the two heck operators. And uh, we can, so this, this extra factor here, uh, uh, well, uh, involves the, the, the counting the number of uh, special vertices and uh, the different and the non-special vertices. So the identity is more complicated. We can also swap spin and the standard to get another identity, okay? So then the, the, the Z0 of standard is a degree five in, uh, you've, in U. So that's uh, it's called the, the Langlands L function of, uh, of the standard type, okay? And the identity is a lot more complicated. But, but 
one, one has that. So this identity uh, for the uh, symplectic group is proved using the representation theoretic uh, method by comparing the, the eigenvalues of the operators. So I would like to end uh, this talk by uh, talking about uh, the distrib distribution of primes. So just like on um, the Riemann zeta function, if we know the behavior of the, uh, the zeta functions, then we know that uh, the, the number of primes up to x uh, has the main term, which is a logarithmic uh, integral of x, which comes from the pole at s equal to one. And the error term, well, well, it depends on the location of the uh, non-trivial zeros, okay? So similarly, uh, for what we have considered here uh, for the uh, uh, compare Riemann surface, then Sonak in his thesis showed that uh, if we uh, consider the number of primes of this compare Riemann surface um, of, of length uh, up to x, its main term comes from the pole at s equal to one of the Selber zeta function, which is a logarithmic uh, integral x. And uh, if it has a bunch of the real uh, zeros in the critical strip between one half and one, and each of that will also contribute to uh, a term, uh, so logarithmic integral or x to, to the uh, power which is given by the location of the real zeros. And the error term is uh, given by uh, x to the three quarters times log x squared. Okay. And for the combinatorial zeta functions, uh, we can see that uh, for each dimension and each given type, and the zeta function is a product of the, the prime geodesics, one over one minus length to the c. And uh, there is a suitable operator so that uh, the zeta function is one over determinant of one minus the operator times u. So likewise, if we know the, uh, the location of the poles of the zeta, in other words, we want to know the eigenvalues of the, this operator t. Okay. So if we can determine the largest eigenvalue in absolute value of t, that's called a lambda. And so I look at the, the circle, absolute value u equal to lambda, and uh, we count the number of distinct eigenvalues of T, which lie on that circle. That number is called a delta. And uh, then if we also know the multiplicity of each eigenvalue with absolute value lambda. So this multiplicity is independent of the eigenvalue with largest possible absolute value. That's called a kappa. Okay. So suppose we know these three quantities, okay, then this uh, delta here has a combinatorial meaning, is the greatest common divisor of the length of the, all the primes of that given dimension of that type, okay? And uh, then we also know the corresponding uh, prime geodesic theorem, uh, so for large N, we know the number of geodesics uh, with the length now will be N times this uh, GCD delta, so it's the kappa with the multiplicity times largest eigenvalue in absolute value lambda raised to the length over n, okay? And the geodesic with length less than n delta is a proportion of what we saw with length equal to n delta, okay? So, so this is known for the PGO2QP, this by Hashimoto, and uh, for PGL three QP, and well, we have this X, um, representation theory actually tells you that uh, explicitly what well the eigenvalues. So we know that well, we can also can give a combinatorial proof, and also do that for uh, PGSP four. So this is a joint work with my ex PhD student. So in his thesis, he he proved this uh, using a. Uh, the group language. So then I gave a, a combinatorial way to see that. I think it's uh, more transparent. Okay. So likewise for the PGO2 and PGO3, if the quotient is Ramnujan, then we get a good bound for the error term. Okay. So that's all I, I would like to say. And uh, so apparently what's lacking uh, in this thing is what happens if I replace uh, P2 
periodic fields backed by R for PGO3 and uh, PGO N, etc. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>